Okay, so with our continuation of chapter 18, what I want to do now is I want to start with the hypothalamus and I want to move down and start talking about each of the different hormones that we want to discuss and which kind of endocrine glands they come from. Um, but like I said, the hypothalamus is the connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So we want to start here. Um, the hypothalamus receives information from pretty much every region of your brain, um, the limbic system, the cerebral cortex, the, the RAS, the thalamus, and so on. And we'll learn more of those from chapter 14. It also receives sensory input from your viscera. That means your internal organs. So it's constantly getting information from your internal organs about what's going on in those areas, as well as receiving information from your visual system, what you're seeing. Um, this area of your brain also regulates your ANS. Remember, ANS stands for autonomic nervous system. Um, because of this as well, the hypothalamus helps with homeostasis, like body temperature, thirst um, center, hunger, sexual behavior, anger, fear, that sort of thing. Um, um, now, there are some cell bodies in the hypothalamus that are called neurosecretory cells. These are located here, and they're going to actually stimulate the endocrine system. They're going to release what we call releasing factors, and a lot of times that's abbreviated as RFs. They're also going to give off um, inhibiting factors, which we call IFs a lot of times, into the blood. And the releasing factors obviously tell a gland to release something. The inhibiting factors are going to tell them to stop releasing something. So these guys are going to help with that link to the endocrine system to talk to the pituitary gland, which is the gland we're going to talk about first. Um, so let's kind of cover some of these releasing factors and inhibiting factors real quick. So we'll go ahead and talk about the pituitary gland first, and then we'll talk about some of these releasing factors and inhibiting factors. All right, so guys, the pituitary gland is also called the hypophysis. It helps the hypothalamus to regulate all aspects of our growth, our development, our metabolism, and also homeostasis. So they're tightly linked together. The pituitary gland is located in the cella turcica of the sphenoid bone. So if you recall back from when we learned the bones in anatomy one, you'll notice it was kind of like a satellite structure and the pituitary sits inside of it. And you can see that here in the picture. So we have that satellite structure, the pituitary gland sits and kind of almost dangles from the brain itself. The way that it is attached to the hypothalamus is by a stalk and this is called the infundulum. The pituitary gland is separated into two distinct areas. The first is called the anterior pituitary. This is called the um, adrenal hypothesis. This is made of epithelial tissue, and this is the one that's actually endocrine tissue. This is the part that is, gonna act is actually going to produce and release hormones. Okay, it's the largest lobe of the pituitary gland. Of course, it's located in the front. That's what anterior means. And it produces and secretes a number of hormones, things like human growth hormone, prolactin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, um, melanocyte stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone. The posterior pituitary is, however, is known as the neurohypothesis, and this is because it is an extension of the hypothalamus and it has a bunch of nervous tissue still in it. Um, it doesn't actually make any hormones, but it does store two hormones. Um, these hormones are produced by those neurosecretory cells we talked about in the hypothalamus, and they're going to be stored in the posterior pituitary and released when needed. These are going to be antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. So with the pituitary secretions, whether they're going to release certain hormones or inhibit um, um, and not release certain hormones is controlled, remember, by these releasing factors and inhibiting factors that come from the hypothalamus. So we want to kind of hit on them for just a minute. Um, if you'll notice, they are abbreviated. If there's an RH in them, they're, of course, a releasing hormone. If they are an IH, they are an inhibiting hormone. So the first group here is the growth hormone releasing hormones as well as the growth hormone inhibiting hormones. Um, the releasing hormone is going to stimulate the secretion of human growth hormone from the anterior pituitary, whereas the inhibiting is going to, um, of course, decrease or inhibit the release of human growth hormone. TRH is thyrotropin releasing hormone. This is going to stimulate the release of thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. We also see GNRH. This is gonadotropic releasing hormone. These are going to be um, released during puberty. This stimulates the secretion of LH and FSH from the anterior pituitary, which are required to um, stimulate um, the release of estrogen and testosterone um, from the gonads. We then see that there is a the prolactin releasing hormone and the prolactin inhibiting hormone. The prolactin releasing hormone, of course, is going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to release prolactin, whereas the inhibiting hormone, which is also dopamine, and dopamine you may have heard about as being a neurotransmitter in the brain, it is going to inhibit the release of prolactin from the anterior pituitary. 
The next one is the corticotropic releasing hormone. This is going to stimulate the release of the adrenocorticotropic hormones as well as the melanocyte stimulating hormones from the anterior pituitary. And so when we look at these guys, there's a number of these hormones that are releasing and inhibiting that the hypothalamus is going to help kind of maintain and keep the pituitary gland releasing what it needs to during different times um, and also inhibit um, certain hormones when they're not needed as well. Now, we're going to focus in and we're going to look at the pituitary gland first. Um, we're going to look at a few hormones that are produced in the pituitary gland and go off to target tissues. And then um, we're going to skip a few of them and get to them when we get to their target tissues. Okay, it kind of looks like we'll be skipping around a little bit, but um, it'll make more sense as we go through these. So if you have the 14th edition of the book, you'll see that there is a table 18.4. Um, this is the summary of the hormones that are found or released by the animal anterior pituitary. It tells you the hormone, it tells you what tissue or target cells they go talk to, and then it tells you what action that they take. Um, what do they tell those particular tissues to do? All right, and so this is a really neat chart to be able to utilize and study. It is found on page 628 if you have the 14th edition of the textbook. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by talking first about human growth hormone. Now you're gonna notice in your notes there were kind of like spaces um, between these hormones. This is for you to like create like a flow chart or what like the domino effect, like this hormone is released that talks to this and then talks to this and so on until we finally get what we need. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna start with the human growth hormone. This is also called somatotropin. This stimulates growth, of course, that's where it gets its name, uh, but it also has a lot of metabolic effects because, guys, human growth hormone is released throughout your life, not just during the times that you're growing, um, and it is needed because it's going to help with your uh, metabolism. When we have a deficiency in human growth, this can lead to different types of dwarfism. Also, if you have excessive amounts of human growth hormone as a child, okay, in children, it can result in what we call gigantism. However, if this happens in adults, like they had normal levels of of human growth hormone up until they were an adult and then it started to increase it actually doesn't cause gigantism it causes what we call acromegaly and this is where um, the person isn't necessarily um, gonna get really tall um, you'll see in this picture here this guy's kind of average he's about 5'8 um, but it does cause some major distinctive issues like with the bones with their where they get thicker and they in their um, thickening because of the whole idea of growing and potentially to um, withstand a larger stature, but they don't actually grow in stature. All right, so when we look at this, these are the two types, like if you have a deficiency versus if you have too much of it. So let's look at when the when human growth hormone gets released, because remember, it does deal a lot of times with metabolism. So when we look at this, if your blood sugar gets low, okay, that means glucose is low in the blood, you're going to see that the hypothalamus is going to detect it. The hypothalamus is then going to release the growth hormone releasing hormone. This is going to talk to the anterior pituitary. Once it talks to the anterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary is going to release human growth hormone. Okay, so it's going to release more growth hormone. When it does this, this growth hormone is going to go and talk to a lot of your different body tissues. It's going to talk to your liver, it's going to talk to your bones, it's going to talk to your muscles, it's going to talk to a lot of areas. Um, it's going to release what we call insulin-like growth factors. And when we look at this, these are going to actually, it's actually going to cause some of your cells like the liver to release glucose. It's going to tell them to release the glucose back into the blood because these cells that the, the human growth hormone has talked to, has um, they've started growing. So they start the process of growing, which means they need more energy, which means we need to increase the blood glucose level, levels. So this is kind of an indirect way to get the blood glucose levels to go up. However, there are times then if you were to eat something and consume something after this has already happened, then your blood glucose um, level goes way high. We don't want it to go too high, so the hypothalamus also monitors this. If it gets too high, again, it's going to release a hormone to the pituitary gland, but now it's going to release the growth hormone inhibiting hormone. This is going to make the pituitary gland release less growth, hom growth hormone. When it releases less growth hormone, it's going to go talk to those tissues, and those tissues are going to then release less insulin-like growth hormone factors. This in turn is going to decrease the blood glucose level. All right, and so when we look at this, growth hormone is going to deal a lot of times with the metabolism because you'll notice a lot of times with kids, especially before they go through a growth spurt, they'll put on a lot of um, kind of weight or they'll eat a lot and you're like, oh my goodness, they're eating like crazy. And then they'll go through a growth spurt and they'll grow several inches and their appetite will return kind of back to normal. The reason for this is because they need that extra um, energy when their cells are going to go through the process of growth growing. 
right? So this is what we use for we see with human growth hormone. In adults, we still need this because we do have tissue damage that happens sometimes and things like that where these cells still need to grow and divide um, to heal and those sort of things. So we still need the growth hormone, just not in as large amounts um, when we're adults. All right, so the next hormone I want to talk to you about is prolactin. Um, prolactin helps initiate milk secretion or the production of milk. Um, by the mammary glands. It does not cause the actual ejection of the milk. That's another hormone with oxytocin. So we need both of these hormones in order for this process of breastfeeding to take place. Um, it does not work alone. It's gonna work a lot of times with estrogen, progesterone, the gluco glucocorticoids, human growth hormone, thyroxin, and insulin. So it has a lot of hormones that are gonna help out with prolactin. Um, excessive prolactin in females can actually cause what we call, call galactoiurea. Now, when we look at this, this is where you have inappropriate milk secretion. And so the milk secretion is happening when it shouldn't. You haven't had a baby or it's been a long time since you've had children um, and you're producing milk and you shouldn't be producing milk. Um, but because of this as well, it also causes amenorrhea, which stops um, or doesn't necessarily stop completely, but it does uh, make the woman irregular when it comes to their periods and that sort of thing. And so amenorrhea is like an abnormal menstrual cycle that takes place. And it could even be the, the, the um, stopping of that menstrual cycle. Now, excessive prolactin in males is going to cause impotence and infertility. So let's take a look at when prolactin is actually needed. Okay, when we need it to be released, what happens? So we'll see that a lot of times this is going to happen right before delivery takes place. Um, there is going to be a drop in progesterone. Once the drop in progesterone happens, this is going to um, tell the, the woman's body that it's time, pretty much getting close to time to having the baby, which means we need to be able to feed the baby. Um, and it also is going to happen whenever the baby suckles. Whenever the baby eats, it's kind of a positive feedback. The more the baby eats, the more prolactin that gets released to ensure the making of more milk. So once we see that there's low progesterone right before delivery or that the baby is actually eating, the hypothalamus is going to detect this and it's going to release prolactin releasing hormone. When it releases prolactin releasing hormone, it's going to go to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is going to release prolactin. Prolactin is then going to talk to the mammary glands. That's the target tissue. At the mammary glands, then it's going to initiate milk production. And this is going to continue as long as the woman is feeding the child, okay, as well as the, as long as the rest of the hormones are also present or gone in order to make sure that this continues. Um, this can be inhibited if a woman gets pregnant while she's still breastfeeding because then progesterone levels go back up. If progesterone levels go back up, this can decrease milk production. Um, we also see that it can happen if certain levels of like estrogen or even human growth hormone or other things are not being produced like they should. Now, when it's time to not feed the baby anymore, the baby is being weaned off, we want to see that there is going to be higher blood uh high blood progesterone and this is going to be during like a subsequent pregnancy or it's going to be the decrease of the suckling. Either one of those is going to cause the hypothalamus to release a, um, prolactin inhibiting hormone. The hypothalamus is going to tell it with this inhibiting hormone to, it's going to tell the anterior pituitary to release less prolactin. The less prolactin that's released, the less the mammary glands are being stimulated. Therefore, it's going to inhibit or stop milk production. All right, so it's showing you on one side what happens whenever we want milk production. On the other side, whenever milk production should stop or cease. <clears throat> All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a step back from those hormones that the anterior pituitary actually um, secretes in, or produces and secretes. And we'll talk about the rest of them as they get to the tissues they're gonna talk to. Um, and we're gonna switch gears and go to the posterior pituitary real quick. So with the posterior pituitary, remember it doesn't actually make its own hormones. It doesn't synthesize them. All it does is store and release two particular hormones. These two hormones are made in the hypothalamus by those neurosecretory cells, and they are going to be sent down to be stored in the posterior pituitary. They're going to be stored here until they get nerve impulses from the hypothalamus and then they are going to be um, excreted through exocytosis. Remember exo means that it's leaving the cells and it's going to go into the interstitial fluid. Eventually it will diffuse into the bloodstream itself. Now, again, if you have the 14th edition of the book, this is table 18.5 and it has a summary again of the type of, a, of hormone. Um, the target tissue, what controls it, and also the principal action. What is it going to actually do? So this table is found on page 631 in your textbook, if again you have the 14th edition. 
So now let's take a look at oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to be released during labor and delivery in very large amounts. Um, this is actually going to be what causes the, uh, the labor part and hopefully again, the delivery of the baby. However, it's also going to be released during lactation. Now oxytocin stimulates contraction of the uterine muscle Okay, so it's gonna cause the uterine muscles to do those contractions, but it's also gonna cause the ejection or letdown of the milk. Um, synthetic oxytocin is known as Pitocin, and you've probably heard about this before. Whenever a woman goes in to have her labor, labor induced or started, um, it's going to be using uh, Pitocin to do this, and it's just a synthetic, synthetic or man-made version of oxytocin. Again, it increases uterine contractions, and sometimes it's even given after birth to control hemorrhage um, if there are some complications in delivery. So let's look at how this one proceeds. Of course, there's gonna be uterine distension or stretching um, and or again, the suckling of the baby when the baby's eating for the letdown of the milk. Uh, but when we look at this uterine side of it, um, when a woman goes into labor and the baby's in position, it starts to put pressure on the um, cervix and the uterus and it causes it to stretch or distend. This is gonna cause the hypothalamus to detect this and it's gonna say, oh, wait a minute, something's going on, we're ready to have this baby. And so those neurosecretory cells are gonna produce the oxytocin. The oxytocin then is going to go into the posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is going to release this oxytocin and the oxytocin is going to do a number of things. First of all, it's gonna go talk to the uterine smooth muscles and it's gonna tell those muscles to contract even further, to, okay, make the contractions stronger. This causes further stretching of the uterus, which then leads it all the way back up to the beginning and it continues until the baby is born. This is why contractions first start out not being as strong and further apart, and then they start to increase in strength and they're going to start to decrease in the time in between the, in, in between the contractions until the baby's born. Now this doesn't mean once the baby's born that, oh, they just stop automatically. It goes the opposite direction. The less oxytocin gets released, then we're gonna see the contractions become um, not as strong and further apart until finally they go away. We also see oxytocin is gonna to talk to the mammary glands. This is gonna allow for milk ejection or let down of milk, um, causing further suckling. However, women a lot of times at first when they start, to, when they talk about breastfeeding their child at the beginning, they will actually have some contractions like their, with their uterus um, when this happens because it also still talks to that. And this is what actually can also help the uterus go back to its normal size um, a little bit quicker if you are breastfeeding a child after birth. Okay, and so this is just some areas that oxytocin works. Now guys, oxytocin is released in males and females. Um, there are a lot of studies that are going into why that is because it, when we look here in this particular flow chart, it just affects females based on labor and delivery and also in the mammary glands. However, oxytocin is released um, during orgasm. Um, it causes the contractions in the pelvic muscles in males and females. Um, so they come sometimes call it the love hormone when they look at that. Um, but oxytocin also has some other um, um, of side effects, it actually makes you more charitable, more compassionate, and things like that. And so they're studying why, when certain individuals release more oxytocin versus others, why that is. Um, uh, and again, these are studies that are continually ongoing. The other hormone that's released by the posterior pituitary is the antidiuretic hormone. Um, this is going to be released when the body indicates that the osmotic pressure of the blood increases. This is normally due to um, maybe blood loss or like a hemorrhage if you're bleeding, but also due to dehydration, meaning there's not enough water in the blood, so it causes that osmotic pressure to go up. Antidiuretic then gets released by the posterior pituitary. Now, how do we know when this happens? Well, there's osmoreceptors. There are special receptors that are constantly monitoring how much water is in your blood. And they're located in the hypothalamus. They're gonna stimulate the increased production of ADH. ADH also is going to go and talk to its target tissue, which is found in the kidneys. When it goes and talks to the kidneys, it's gonna tell the kidneys to hold on to any extra water. This is gonna decrease your urine output. Now, a deficiency in ADH, meaning you're not making enough of it, can actually cause what we call diabetes insipidus. This is going to be where we have the lack of the ability to concentrate the urine. So even though the person's dehydrated, they're still creating lots of urine, which then can cause them to be dehydrated even more. And so this is a big problem if we cannot control the amount of urine that's being released and because dehydration can, can cause major issues. So let's look at again at the flow chart of how this works. So high blood osmotic pressure, again due to dehydration or blood loss, 
loss, the hypothalamus is going to detect this by its osmoreceptors. The neurosecretary cells are going to produce the ADH. Now, while this is happening, the hypothalamus is also going to trigger your thirst mechanism. It's going to cause you to feel thirsty where you're going to want to drink water. Again, though, this is going to add water to your blood. Okay, eventually, it just has to go a little bit through the digestive system to do this. The posterior pituitary, remember, is going to release the antidiuretic hormone. This hormone is going to go talk to the kidneys first. So when it goes and talks to the kidneys, it's going to talk specifically to the distal convoluted tubules of the kidneys, and this will make more sense when we get to the chapter that talks about the urinary system. But what it tells those tubes is it says, hey, I need you to reabsorb any water. Don't let any water leave through the urine, if at all possible. And so what these what this part of the kidneys does then is it's going to reabsorb the water, concentrating the urine, and the urine will be darker in color and you'll produce less. Okay, so you won't be going to the bathroom as often, and the urine will be darker in color with less water. It's also going to talk to the artery walls. So not only is its target tissue mostly the kidneys, it's also going to tell the artery walls, which have um, a lot of muscle to them, to do what we call vasoconstriction. And so what happens here is the blood vessels are maybe this size, and it tells them to vasoconstrict, so they get smaller. When they get smaller like this, it raises the blood pressure. All right, so this is kind of like a temporary fix until we can get water back in there, and then we can open up the blood vessel back again. All right, so it's going to cause some vasoconstriction where we can raise the blood pressure for a short time. It's also going to talk to your sweat glands. It's going to tell your sweat glands to, to decrease the production of sweat. Okay, because sweat, when you sweat, you lose water. Okay, so the whole point of this is to conserve and hold on to what water you do have in your body until you can add some, just like the thirst mechanism is trying to get you to do. All right, so now we're going to end up talking about different target tissues, which this is going to bring back some of those anterior pituitary hormones which stimulate these targets. So we want to talk about the thyroid gland next. The thyroid gland is located just below your larynx, and guys, your larynx is kind of your voice box, so whenever you're talking the area that's vibrating, this is going to be just right below it. It has a right and left side, so it kind of looks like a butterfly. We look at this. The thyroid glands, when we look at their tissue, their microscopic tissue, they have some sac areas that are called follicles. Um, these follicular cells are going to be the ones that release the T3 and T4, which we'll talk a little more about what those are, but those are the thyroid hormones. And then outside of these follicles, there's what we call parafollicle cells, and they're going to release a third hormone, which is called calcitonin. So the thyroid itself is going to release three hormones that we're going to discuss. Now, the thyroid hormones, this is T3 and T4, they're produced in response to thyroid stimulating hormone. This is the hormone that's released from the anterior pituitary. So when this happens, it actually stimulates the thyroid to do what we call iodide trapping. In order to make T3 and T4, we need iodine. Well, how are we going to get this iodine? So you actually need some of this in your diet, okay, in very small amounts, but you still need it. So the iodide is actually going to be transported into the follicular cells, but they have to be trapped there in order to do this. Once there's enough iodide present, it can then produce T3 and T4. This T3 and T4 can be secreted then into the blood. Now, T3 and T4, these are lipid-soluble hormones. They don't like to be in the water, okay, because they're a type of fat. And so when they get added into the water, a lot of times they're going to be bound Okay, to a protein, we talked about this in the last section in part one of the um, endocrine system where the fat soluble like to be bound to a protein. And when they're bound to the protein in the blood, this is called GB. <clears throat> this is called TBG. This is the roxin binding globulin. This is the protein that binds to T3 and T4. Now, what's the difference between T3 and T4? Well, T3, guys, is called triiodithyroxinine. Now, this means that there are three um, we're going to see like three iodines here. That's what the tri means. And so this is the more active form. It's a very, there's going to be very small amounts of T3 in your blood because your cells are going to actually be using it. All right. Cause they, they, that's the more active form and they'll use it first. T4 on the other hand means tetra. So when we look at tetra, tetra means four. So this is going to have the four iodide on it. This is also known as thyroxin. This is the less active form. So we should see larger amounts of this in the blood versus the T3. So when you do like a total blood work, up, they're going to actually look at your thyroid and look at your T3 and T4 levels. If your T3 levels are lower than your T4, that's normal, okay? That should be the way it is. However, if these are out of 
whack in any way, it could cause some problems. And we'll talk a little more about them later when there's problems with these hormones. Now, T3 and T4 are going to help regulate your metabolic rate. So they're going to help you keep like your basal metabolic rate. Um, so what your base is, just so you know, as you get older, these guys don't work as well and your metabolic rate starts to decrease. We also say that it's going to help control thermostasis. So your whole idea of your temperature, your internal temperature, growth and development, and also the reactivity of the nervous system. So these thyroid hormones are not just there for your metabolism. They can actually, they actually do a lot more stuff that uh, the body does need them for. So let's talk about how this kind of works. We see that the thyroid hormone levels are controlled by the amount of iodine that are present because we have to have we have to have the iodide in order to make these hormones, the T3 and T4, but they're also going to be regulated by that um, thyroxin releasing hormone that comes from the hypothalamus, but also the thyroid stimulating hormone that comes from the pituitary. Okay, so when we look at this, it's really important to see that if we have a thyroid problem, the thyroid may be fine, it's not causing an issue, but it could actually be the pituitary or the hypothalamus that is not allowing enough of these hormones to be released, the T3 and T4. Now, some disorders of the thyroid gland, um, I told you we'd talk about this a little bit later, and here we are. There's cretinism, and this is with a, a type of hypothyroid out, um, hypothyroidism. Hypo, remember, means low, so this is low amounts of T3 and T4, and this actually happens during infancy when a child is small, um, right after they're born. Um, this can lead to forms of dwarfism and also severe mental retardation, because if you'll recall, not only does it help with growth and development metabolism, it also helps with the reactivity of the nervous system, so it can also cause severe mental retardation. On the other hand, amexidemia is hyp hypothyroidism during adulthood, so if you're older and you develop hyper, or if you're older and you develop hypothyroidism, um, it can cause symptoms like a puffy face, your, your heart rate gets slower, uh, lower body temperature, which makes you more sensitive to the cold, your hair and skin will start to dry out, will have muscle weakness, a lethargy where you feel tired a lot, and even weight gain, again, because it decreases your metabolism when you don't have enough T3, T4. On the other hand, we have what we see Graves' disease or Graves' disease, it's autoimmune hyperthyroidism. This is where the immune system, it actually starts attacking the thyroid and it acts like thyroid stimulating hormones. So it tells the thyroid, it's, it's attacking it, but it's telling the thyroid to create more T3 and T4 in amounts that are way higher than what you need. Um, so it's constantly being stimulated. This can cause ocular edema, so it can actually cause swelling around the eyes. Um, heat intolerance, where you can't stand the heat because you're already sweating and having an issue. Um, Weight loss, even with a high appetite, so you're eating like crazy, but you're losing weight very quickly because your metabolism is so high. Um, insomnia and even nervousness. And you're thinking like, well, this isn't too bad. I'd rather have hyperthyroidism than hypothyroidism because at least I would be skinnier. The problem is it also causes tachycardia, your heart to be beating really quickly. And this can cause some major issues um, to other systems as well. Um, we also see too, when the thyroid gets overstimulated, it causes hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is where the thyroid gets bigger because it's being used more, just like when you um, work out and you use certain muscles more often than others, they're gonna get larger. Um, this can actually create what we call a goiter. A goiter is an enlarged thyroid gland and you can see it here in the picture. Um, it is seen a lot of times with Graves' disease. Um, and it can also be seen with a dietary deficiency of iodine. If there's not enough iodine in their diet, it can cause this to happen as well because the, uh, the thyroid's trying to trap whatever iodine it can and it has to work harder to do so, so it gets larger in size. Um, of course, also tumors, different types of cancers can also cause thyroid problems as well. All right, so this is talking about the rest of the thyroid gland. The last hormone that the thyroid does release is calcitonin. A lot of times we represent this with CT. Do not get this confused with connective tissue, um, but calcitonin here is secreted when blood calcium levels get too high, and it's going to help lower those calcium levels, and we'll talk a little bit more about the flow chart of this as well, but first, let's do the flow chart with our T3 and T4. How do we create more of that when needed? All right, so when we look at T3 and T4, we're going to notice that if there's low amounts of this T3 and T4 in the blood, um, your metabolic rate is going to start to decrease. It's going to lower. And so the hypothalamus is going to detect that the, the metabolic rate has decreased. This is going to 
cause the release of the thyrotropin releasing hormone. It's going to tell the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. All right, so we haven't even got to the thyroid yet. We've just detected that the levels are low. The hypothalamus has sent its message the, to the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary has sent its message. Now, thyroid stimulating hormone is actually going to talk to the thyroid gland. Once it talks to the thyroid gland, this is going to increase that iodide tra trapping we talked about, where we're going to trap more iodide and actually speed up the process of making more T3 and T4. Once T3 and T4 are made and produced, they are going to be released. So T3 and T4 will be released by the thyroid gland. When T3 and T4 get released, they're going to increase your body's metabolic rate. This means that most of the cells in your body actually have receptors for the thyroid hormones. It's going to regulate growth and development. It's going to help um, maintain your body temperature. And it's going to, again, uh, relate to the activity of your nervous system, how quickly your nervous system can respond to different things. This is why when individuals have hypothyroidism, they are lethargic, they're tired, but also their reactive time is also going to be a lot slower because their nervous system is not being stimulated as well as it should because the T3 and T level, T3 and T4 levels are too low. All right, so now let's switch gears and let's look at the flow chart for calcitonin when we need to release that particular hormone. So we see that there's high blood calcium. This could be due to you just eating something that had a lot of calcium in it, like drinking milk, something like that. All right, so your body's absorbed it and your blood level of calcium is high. The thyroid gland's gonna detect this. Now, if you'll notice, there's no hypothalamus here and there's no pituitary gland. This is directly going to be controlled by your thyroid gland. Your thyroid gland's gonna detect that the blood calcium level is high. So then it's going to release calcitonin. So there's no middleman here. The thyroid gland detects that there's something wrong. It's going to release calcitonin. Calcitonin is then going to go talk to the osteoblast. Now, if you'll recall, osteo means bone. Okay, so this is going to be your bone tissue. And the blasts were the builders. They're the ones that actually build the bone. So they are going to then be stimulated to start uh, absorbing more of that blood calcium. They absorb more of the blood calcium and they deposit it into the bone matrix. Because remember, bone is a connective tissue and its matrix is solid made out of calcium and phosphates. So that calcium is going to be absorbed from the blood and put into the bone, okay, making your bones stronger. And the whole point of this too is it's gonna lower the blood calcium level. So this is how calcitonin is going to work. And this is the first time in the flow chart, guys, that you've noticed that the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are not involved here. The thyroid gland is the one that has the receptors that detects the change in the calcium level. All right, so this is going to lead us to our next um, set of glands, which are called the parathyroid glands. These are going to help the thyroid gland in regulating blood calcium levels. So when we looked at the thyroid, it released calcitonin when calcium levels were high and brought the levels down. What happens when the levels are low and we need to bring them up. Well, this is where the parathyroid comes in. It's located on the back surface of the thyroid, and there are two parathyroid glands on each side. So remember, this is like a butterfly-like shape structure, so it has a right and a left side. On the back side, you're going to have two parathyroid hormones on each side. You have two on the right side and two on the left side, so that's where they're going to be. All right, they're very small, and in this picture, you can see that they're very small, and, I, and um, they're kind of greenish in color. Now, the parathyroid glands are going to release parathyroid hormone, PTH. Parathyroid hormone is secreted when blood calcium levels get too low, okay? So sometimes your calcitonin tells those osteoblasts to do their job, and they just do too good of a job. They take out too much of the calcium from the blood, um, and then you haven't replaced it by eating something that had calcium in it. Now remember, calcium is needed not only for your bones to be strong, but it's needed for your nervous system to release neurotransmitters, but it's also going to be needed to by your muscles in order to contract. And so calcium doesn't just need to be in the bones. So when the levels get too low, low blood calcium is detected, the parathyroid glands are going to detect this. They are then going to release parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is also going to go talk to the bone. Now not only is it going to talk to the bone, but it's going to talk to the osteoclasts in the bone tissue, not the osteoblasts. The blasts built the bone tissue. The osteoclasts break it down. So the osteoclasts come in, and they're going to start breaking down the matrix, releasing the calcium back to the blood. All right, now this does take a little bit of time in order to do this, but we want to make sure that we're returning it back to the blood. Now this doesn't mean it's going to break down your bones to where they get super weak. All right, it's just replacing, or it's just um, taking enough to increase that blood glucose level. 
We also see though that parathyroid glands don't just talk to the osteoclasts. They also are gonna go talk to the kidneys. When they talk to the kidneys, it's going to tell the kidneys to prevent any loss of calcium. So as the body is going through the process of um, getting some of the calcium back into the blood, whatever calcium is in the blood, we wanna make sure it doesn't get lost in the urine. And so it tells the kidneys to make sure that any calcium that comes through that you don't let it leave, okay? It's gonna get put back into the blood and that way we don't lose it um, through the urine. It's also gonna tell the kidneys to increase the renal production of a type of hormone called calcicitrol. Calcicitrol is a vital hormone slash enzyme that's needed to activate vitamin D. Okay, vitamin D is something that your skin can actually produce for you if you're out in the sun. The problem is though, skin cancer is a big thing and if you put on sunscreen, you don't get to actually make vitamin D anymore with your skin. So a lot of times we get our vitamin D from our diet um, you'll see some of our um, foods, especially like milk, it'll say fortified with vitamin D. And this calcicitrol is going to go with parathyroid hormone and talk to the intestine. And it's going to tell the intestine, hey, we need you to increase the absorption of any calcium that comes into the body. Now, there's a catch. We can take calcium in all day, but if we don't have vitamin D present, we cannot actually absorb it. So this is why calcicitrol needs to come in and also help activate the vitamin D. That way we can absorb whatever calcium you do take in through your diet. All right, so this is how the parathyroid gland is going to work, releasing parathyroid hormone. All right, now we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk a little bit about the adrenal glands. Um, if you recall, I told you the adrenal glands were glands that look like little hats on top of the kidneys and you can kind of see how that looks here now in the picture. Um, the adrenal glands are gonna be really important in regulating your sodium and potassium levels. If you'll recall, all cells in your body have those sodium potassium pumps where they're constantly sending sodium out, potassium's in, sodium out, potassium in. So we wanna make sure that those levels are, maintain, are maintained throughout the body and the adrenal glands are gonna help with this. Also, the adrenal glands are gonna help your body resist any stress that comes through. Um, they're gonna be very helpful whenever your body gets stressed in those fight or flight type situations. Um, and it's also going to help as an anti-inflammatory, okay? So we've got the adrenal glands doing a number of things. Now there is one adrenal gland located on the top of each kidney. The outer part of the adrenal gland is called the cortex. You actually see it in the picture here where it's striped, that's the cortex. Um, it's gonna release two hormones, aldosterone and cortisol, which we will talk about. The innermost part of the adrenal gland is called the medulla, okay, and you'll notice it's the more smooth-like structure inside of the adrenal gland. It's also gonna secrete two hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which again, we'll discuss in a minute. So we're gonna start first with the adrenal cortex. Okay, so we're moving on to the adrenal cortex hormones first. Um, the first we wanna talk about is aldosterone. Aldosterone is also known as a mineral corticoid. Um, aldosterone, the reason it's known as this is mineral at the beginning is because it's talking about sodium and potassium. So it's gonna actually increase sodium reabsorption. Let's take sodium back in, but because of that, when we take sodium in, potassium is gonna be excreted, and this is gonna happen within the kidneys. Um, this is to help regulate your sodium and potassium levels in your body. Now, this is gonna use a particular type of pathway. This pathway is called the renin-angiotensin pathway, which we're gonna discuss real briefly here. Um, when we look at the renin-angiotensin pathway, this occurs when your total blood volume, TBV, gets too low. It's decreased. Now, this could be due to bleeding or it could be due to dehydration. Um, this is also gonna cause your blood pressure to decrease because you don't have as much fluid in it. This is gonna be detected by your juxtoglomular cells. These are special cells inside the kidneys which um, contain stretch receptors. So when blood pressure is high, they're stretched and they feel that they're stretched. But when blood pressure gets too low, they're not being stretched as much. So they are actually gonna send out the signal when there is less stress um, or stretch on them um, when there's low blood pressure. So anytime this blood pressure drops, these juxtoglomular cells are going to secrete an enzyme called renin. Renin is gonna be released into the blood and it's gonna activate a protein that's found in the blood plasma. Okay, plasma is the liquid that's in the blood and this protein is circulating in an inactive form. What renin does as an enzyme is it activates it. It goes from angiotensin to angiotensin one. Now, angiotensin one still doesn't do us any good. As it continues to circulate through the blood, it's going to reach the lungs. In the lungs, there's another enzyme called ACE. ACE is angiotensin converting enzyme. This is gonna convert angiotensin one into angiotensin 
2. Once we have angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 is going to go and talk to the adrenal cortex. It's going to tell the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. Now we're actually at the hormone that we're discussing. Once aldosterone is secreted, it's going to go to the kidneys and tell the kidneys to um, reabsorb more sodium, don't let it out, and excrete more potassium. When this happens, it's going to raise the sodium level, but indirectly because sodium is being held in, water also follows, okay? Water really likes sodium. So when sodium moves into the blood, water moves with it. So this is another way to add water back to our blood with the kidneys, but we're going to do it in a different way by pulling sodium first, which then attracts the water. This will increase the total blood volume, raising the blood pressure back to normal. Now, angiotensin 2 also, not only is it telling the um, adrenal glands to release aldosterone, it also causes vasoconstriction of the arteries. So those arterioles are smaller vessels of the arteries. It'll cause, again, the vasoconstriction, which helps raise the blood pressure for a short period of time. Now, if you have excessive amounts of aldosterone, this is called aldosterism, this um, leads to excessive sodium reabsorption. This means that when you're um, absorbing excessive amounts of sodium, it causes water retention, so it causes lots of swelling through your body, but then it can also cause hypertension, which means that you have a increase in the blood pressure as well. Um, so it indirectly causes that. Now, another thing it does too, though, because we're absorbing so much of the sodium, we're also excreting and getting rid of the potassium. So this can cause hypocalcemia. Calcemia. Now, if you'll notice here, it's it's pronounced hypocalcemia, but the calcemia is spelled with a K. That's telling you it's potassium. This can cause your muscles to become weak and even cause paralysis if not treated. Now, on the other hand, Addison's disease is if there's a, de a deficiency in aldosterone. There's not enough of it. Um, now, Addison's disease is also going to be a deficiency in the other hormone that's released by the cortex of the adrenal glands, which is the cortisol. Um, the adrenal cortex isn't responding for some reason. It stops producing the aldosterone, but it also stops producing cortisol. This leads to renal loss of the sodium. So what happens is since sodium's leaving, water wants to leave too, so it increases the chance of the lower blood pressures. Um, because the blood pressure is lower, it causes mental lethargy, makes you where you're not getting enough blood to the brain, makes you tired. Um, anorexia, now this isn't the anorexia when you think about the mental disorder where you think you look fat and you don't want to eat. This is anorexia because you don't feel good and so you don't want to eat, okay? And this happens a lot of times when you're sick. Um, this will then lead again to muscle weakness, hypoglycemia because your blood sugars will drop since you're not eating and so on, all right? And so this is a just to give you an idea of Addison's disease. So let's look at the flow chart for aldosterone. So we have low sodium levels. Um, this is normally going to be seen a lot of times when the blood pressure is low and or the total blood volume is low. Remember, total blood volume could be low due to dehydration or it could be low due to hemorrhage or bleeding. When this happens, it causes the renin pathway to take place. Renin gets released, which is going to be used to create angiotensin 1, which then in the lungs, another enzyme ACE is going to convert that into angiotensin 2. Two. Angiotensin 2 then returns to the adrenal cortex, causing the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Once it releases that aldosterone, it talks to the distal convoluted tubules of the kidneys. So guys, if you'll notice, this talks to the exact same area that antidiuretic hormone talks to. Now remember, antidiuretic hormone is sucking the water back, okay? But it can't get it 100%. I mean, how easy is it to hold on to water? Think about when water spills on the table. You can't hold on to it. So we want to pull as much water back. Well, well, aldosterone is going to also help with this. It's going to increase the absorption of the sodium. The sodium then attracts the water and it pulls even more water back. So guys, aldosterone is actually going to work with antidiuretic hormone in order to raise the blood pressure by returning water back to the blood. Now, this does cause an indirect loss of potassium, which could be a problem if we have too much potassium that is lost through the urine. Now, guys, um, the renin angiotensin pathway is also known as RAA, and this is a picture that kind of shows you um, what I had before just in words, but it kind of puts some pictures into it as well. Um, so this, again, is showing you the pathway of how this takes place um, from step one all the way to step pretty much 15, um, where we see that hopefully the, we're going to be raising the blood pressure, okay? Again... If you have the 14th edition of the book, this is found on page 640. <clears throat> 
Now, the other hormone that is released by the adrenal glands um, when we talk about the cortex is what we call the glucocorticoids or more specifically cortisol. Cortisol is involved in metabolism. It raises your blood glucose level. Um, this helps your body resist stress, so raises your blood pressure to help you be able to resist stress, um, and it's also an anti-inflammatory. So cortisol is regulated, guys, by the corticotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. This is going to cause a release in the adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary. When the anterior pituitary sends out ACTH, it tells the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol. Cortisol then gets secreted and we see that it's going to raise blood glucose, it's going to help the body resist stress and so on. Now, if there's a deficiency in this, there's not enough of this cortisol as well as aldosterone. Remember, it's Addison's disease, which we've already discussed previously. Um, on the other hand, if we have an over secretion of the ACTH, which leads to an over secretion of the cortisol, this is actually called Cushing syndrome. Cushing, Cushing syndrome, some um, symptoms or um, signs of Cushing syndrome is skinny arms and legs, a moon-shaped face, um, what we call a buffalo hump, which is in the back, the top part of the back where they get um, some a fatty bump there back in the back, hyperglycemia where their blood sugars are too high, and it can cause a decreased immunity because cortisol suppresses the immune system. And so let's take a look at, again, its flow chart. So we see we have blood blow, we have low blood cortisol. This low blood cortisol is going to then be detected by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to release that corticotropic releasing hormone, which talks to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is going to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, which is going to go talk to the adrenal cortex. Once it talks to the adrenal cortex, it's going to release the cortisol. Cortisol, again, is the glucoco glucocorticoid. When it does this, it's going to increase the blood glucose levels so that your body, the cells that are needing during that stressful time, they are going to be able to get the glucose they need in order for you to survive. It's also going to increase the blood pressure so that you can resist stress, and we see that it does act as an anti-inflammatory. This decreases the immune response. Again, a lot of times, guys, cortisol is going to be released when you are in a stressful situation. Um, it's called the stress hormone, and we do need it. We just need it in small amounts. We don't want it released constantly. If it's released constantly, it can cause some issues. This is why a lot of times when you're really stressed out as a college student, um, you get sick more often. Okay, You'll catch colds and things like that that you normally wouldn't have caught if you're stressed out. You also see this happening even before like happy events like um, uh, weddings or births or things like that where you're excited about what's going to happen, but your body is stressed, you're stressed out about it. And so because of that, it does release more of this cortisol. Um, just to let you kind of know, um, Addison's disease, uh, President Kennedy had Addison's disease. Um, he kept it under wraps. Um, pretty much came out after, after um, he was assassinated that he did have Addison's disease. And then here's a picture of an individual who has Cushing syndrome. So it kind of just is giving you the difference where we see some... Um, signs and symptoms for Addison's, which we talked about on some previous slides, versus Cushing's disease, which you see here. All right, so now we're moving on to the adrenal medulla. This is the center part of the adrenal glands. This contains what we call chromaffin cells. Chromaffin cells are going to be directly innervated by the autonomic nervous system. Now, this is really important because the autonomic nervous system has that the two branches. It has the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest, and it has the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight. We're going to see that the adrenal medulla is directly innervated by this autonomic nervous system. Now, the adrenal medulla hormones get secreted anytime the body is stressed out, okay? Just like we saw with cortisol, it's going to be released when you're stressed. So is the medulla hormones. This is epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. These are going to be released um, when your body's stressed. However, the adrenal medulla is going to, going to release more epinephrine than, nor, than norepinephrine. About 80% of what it releases is epinephrine, 20% um, is norepinephrine. Now, both of these are what we call, um, what they do is they mimic the sympathetic nervous system. So they cause an effect similar to the sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system, that fight or flight. So when we look at this, epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be released when your body is trying to resist stress. So what they're going to do is they're going to increase your heart rate. Okay, that's what the HR stands for. We're going to see also increased respiration rate. That's RR. Increased BP, which is blood pressure. We're going to see an increase in glucose because, again, your cells that are going to need it for that fight or flight type of um, 
uh, job. They're going to need more glucose for more energy. And it's also going to cause vasoconstriction. This is going to raise the blood pressure because the blood vessels are constricting. On the other hand, it's going to cause bronchial dilation. So your bronchial and your lungs will start to dilate, and this again increases your respiration rate. Now, when there's a tumor located in the adrenal uh, medulla, it can actually cause these hormones to be released in excessive levels. This is called phenochromosatoma. Uh, this causes fatigue because you get really tired because your body is releasing these in too much amount so that it makes you tired. It causes a very uh, rapid heart rate, but it also will eventually cause weakness. And this happens when your body gets too stressed out and it doesn't get that break, it causes your body to go into an exhaustion state. And in this exhaustion state, you're going to see that you're tired, there's weakness. However, the heart rate is still going to be high, rapid, because of the hormones that have been released, the epi and the norepinephrine. So let's look at the flow chart that goes along with this. So of course, stress is gonna be our trigger here. Once we detect that there's stress, the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, the nerves are going to cause the fight or flight response. But remember, they are directly innervated into the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal medulla gets a signal that, hey, we're in a fight or flight situation. This causes the chromaffin cells to then release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay, because remember I told you in the last um, PowerPoint that these two systems are connected. The nervous system and the, uh, and the hormones are connected. The nervous system acts quickly, whereas the hormones are going to take a little bit longer. But remember, the nervous system is fast and then it's gone, but the hormones will last longer once they're released. So epinephrine and norepinephrine is going to be released. Um, again, mostly epinephrine. This is again going to mimic or simulate the fight or flight response for a longer period of time. Okay, so this is why a lot of times people who have been in like a car accident things like that and they're hurt, they may not realize how hurt they are until later once these hormones start to decrease in their body. This allows you to be able to hopefully survive the situation, get out of the situation before it kicks in that you're in pain and things like that. Um, this is what, again, um, you'll hear sometimes where moms, when their kids are in danger, they do these like miraculous type things like picking up cars and stuff like that. This happens sometimes because of these really big rushes of adrenaline and nor, um, noradrenaline in order to allow those things to happen. And a lot of times, though, when you come off those, it causes you to shake or go into shock because they were helping you be able to process things um, during that fight or flight situation. Okay, so they mimic that situation just for a longer period of time because they're hormones. Again, this is the whole point is to help the body resist stress, okay, to resist whatever stress has come through. All right, so the next one we want to talk about or the next gland we want to talk about is the pancreas. Now, the pancreas, guys, um, it mostly is going to be um, active in digestion. However, it does have some areas within it that have endocrine cells. These endocrine cells are going to help regulate your blood glucose levels. Um, and then other cells there, of course, are going to help with digestion. This is located posteriorly and slightly inferior to your stomach, so below it and behind your stomach. There are four types of endocrine cells that are present here. They're clustered together in what we call the isolates of Langerhans. Okay, so you can see them here in this picture where you have the isolates are clustered together. The alpha cells are going to secrete glucagon. This is when blood glucose get, levels get too low. It will raise your glucose levels. So alpha cells secrete glucagon. Beta cells, on the other hand, secrete insulin. When they secrete insulin, this is when your blood glucose levels too high, so we want to bring it down. So if you'll notice, those glucagon and insulin are antagonistic, they're opposites, okay? So if blood glucose levels are high, you're going to see that insulin is going to be secreted and glucagon is not. However, if they get too low, glucagon is going to be secreted and insulin is not. So we see that they're antagonistic, they're opposites. The D cells are going to actually release somatotropicin. This is the um, growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Um, a lot of times these delta cells are going to secrete this right after or right when you have a meal. The reason is we don't know what is in that meal. We don't know how much sugar is going to be absorbed. We're not sure. And so this is to keep the alpha and beta cells kind of at bay until we know what the blood glucose level is going to do. If the blood glucose level then gets high because you had like say a piece of cake, we then want the beta cells to be stimulated so the delta cells will back off and allow the beta cells to do their job and so on. But a lot of times what the delta cells are there to do is to kind of keep the alpha and beta cells in check until we know for sure if we need to release glucose glucagon or insulin. 
The F cells are mostly the pancreatic polypeptide cells. They're involved in digestion, which will be covered in the digestive um, chapter. Now, diabetes mellitus is a deficiency in insulin. This causes hyperglycemia, so your blood sugar stays too high. Um, because the blood sugar is so high, glycouria, this is where we see that there's major glucose or sugar in the urine, polyuria, where there's more urine being produced and excessive thirst. All right, and these are just some of the symptoms and signs of diabetes. If this diabetes is not controlled, of course, we can see more advanced things that can take place. Hyperinsulinism is where we have an overproduction of insulin. This was where you actually make too much and it's not being kept in check. This causes your body to go into the opposite, um, which is hypoglycemia, where the blood sugar drops too quickly. This causes you to have tremors, sweating, uh, but again, both of these, if the blood sugar is too high or too low, can cause major issues um, in, a, in an individual and ultimately could cause comas and death if, not, uh, if they're left untreated for long periods of time. So let's take a look at how the pancreas works. Now guys, the pancreas is shown here in the picture and it's the yellow organ that we see here. Um, if your blood glucose level is low, we're gonna see that the pancreas is going to stimulate the alpha cells. The alpha cells are going to release glucagon. Glucagon is then going to tell your liver cells to release the extra glycogen that it stored up. This is called glycogenolysis. Um, lysis means to break. Okay, so we have a storehouse. We have an area in your liver where we store extra sugars for a later time, and this is that time that we need them. So then they start breaking them off and adding them to the blood. It's also going to tell the liver cells to start converting lactic acid. This is a byproduct of fermentation in your muscles when you don't get them enough oxygen. That's what causes your muscles to be sore when you work out and you hold your breath or you're out of shape. Um, it's going to take that lactic acid and convert it back to amino acids and then also then into glucose um, so that it can be used again. Um, this is going to be the liver doing most of this kind of work in order to release more glucose to your cells. On the other hand, if your blood glucose level is too high, the beta cells are going to be stimulated in the pancreas. They are going to release insulin. When they release insulin, insulin is going to help glucose enter your body cells. So it's going to tell a lot of different cells in your body to take in the extra insulin. The insulin is going to tell a lot of different body cells in your body to take in the extra glucose so that they can use it to make more energy, uh, more ATP. It's also going to tell the liver cells to convert this glucose back in back into glycogen so that it can be stored for later. So this is again building its storehouse again. This is called glycogenesis. Genesis means to begin or make. Um, it also tells the liver cells to spend uh, more time making proteins. Um, the whole pro process of protein synthesis, transcription, translation, it takes a lot of energy to do this. Well, let's speed up the process. Let's get some of that energy being used so that we use more of the glucose in order to create more energy. Also though, it tells your adipose cells those are your fat cells to speed up lipogenesis. So it actually takes an extra glucose and converts it into fat, all right? And so we don't want this to happen. Um, this is why it's really important for you to have more of a well-balanced diet because if you're eating stuff that's really, really high in sugar, your body only needs so much and your liver can only store so much and so then the rest gets stored in your fat cells and it's a lot harder to access them and get rid of them um, in that area. All right, so before we kind of move on, I want to hit on the testes and ovaries, which are going to talk about the hormones that deal with reproduction, um, and also um, the, male, the, the male and female sex hormones. We'll talk a little bit more about them in the reproductive chapter as well. Um, but when we look at the testes, guys, there's two oval glands. They're located in the scrotum. They're involved in sperm production, male um, sex characteristics, like um, deepening of the voice, hair, hair, body hair, things like that, uh, bone growth, and also protein animalism, the creating of extra muscles. And you can kind of see that where when a male goes through puberty, then their fat distribution kind of changes and so does the muscle tone. Now, in the testes, there's what we call interstitial cells or Langdon cells. These are going to secrete testosterone. They will secrete testosterone um, when they're stimulated by a luteinizing hormone, which comes from the anterior pituitary. Um, the anterior pituitary knows when to release the luteinizing hormone when gonadotropic releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus. This takes place during puberty. Now, testosterone is then going to stimulate sperm production. It's going to cause the testes to start making sperm, but it also is going to cause male sex characteristics like the deep boot deeper voice, facial hair, thicker bones, and so on. Um, spermatogenic cells are the cells which develop into mature spermatozoa. These are going to be um, eventually become the sperm. However, they cannot mature completely until um, FSH or follicle stimulating hormone is released by the anterior pituitary. 
And then we also see that there's serotorally cells. These are nurse cells. Um, they are going to secrete a hormone called inhibin. Um, in the testes, there's only so much room. So if all of the, the, the room is taken by maturing sperm at a given time, we don't want to create more, okay? We don't want to overbook the area. We don't want to overcrowd the area. So because of this, when all of the spaces are full, kind of like in a hotel or something like that, and there's no vacancy, the serotoli cells, the nurse cells, they tell the anterior pituitary, hey, we're full. We cannot have any more um, sperm coming in here for maturing. So it actually inhibits the follicle stimulating hormone and this helps regulate the sperm production. Once there's room available, it stops secreting inhibin so follicle stimulating hormone can be released and the process then can continue. On the other hand, guys, when we look at the ovaries found in females, they are also two oval glands. They are located, however, in the pelvic cavity. They are lateral to the uterus. There's one on each side. They're involved in egg production, female sex characteristics, the reproductive cycle, pregnancy, milk production, and also delivery. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary, is going to tell the ovaries to produce the follicle, okay, or the egg, um, and it's going to secrete also estrogens, okay, it's going to tell the ovary to secrete estrogens. Luteinizing hormone, on the other hand, is also released from the anterior pituitary. Now, remember, both of these are going to be um, released during puberty when gonadotropic releasing hormone is released. Um, this is going to tell the follicle to mature, and it actually causes ovulation. When the follicle matures enough, it ruptures, releasing the egg, and this is what we call ovulation. It also tells the ovaries to secrete more estrogen and progesterone, and the whole point of this is to help prepare for potential implantation of that egg that they just released. Estrogens are involved in the female reproductive cycle, and this is why they'll go up and down, and we'll talk again more about those when we get to reproduction. Estrogens also cause female sex characteristics like the higher voice, the lack of facial hair, uh, female distribution of fat. This is why females become more curvy, because the fat is going to be distributed in different areas. Progesterone also prepares the endometrium and the mammary glands for potential pregnancy, just in case um, there's implantation and fertilization of that egg. Um, if there is fertilization and implantation of the egg, it also inhibits uterine contractions during the pregnancy, um, and it tells the anterior pituitary not to secrete any more LH or FSH because the space is already taken. The uterus is already being used to grow a new individual, so we don't want to produce any more eggs. LH and FSH are secreted in response again to the gonadotropic releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. Ovaries will also release two other hormones besides estrogen and progesterone called relaxin and inhibin. Relaxin is going to soften the pubic symphysis. If you recall your hip bones, okay, they are connected in the front by the pubic symphysis, which is a really hard cartilage. Um, when it's time for delivery of the baby, you're going to see that relaxin is going to be released, which is going to cause the softening of that cartilage. It's also going to cause the softening of the cervix of the uterus and allow for dilation to take place. Inhibin is going to tell the anterior pituitary not to secrete any more follicle stimulating hormone. Inhibin is going to do this a lot of times when we've already released um, the egg and we're waiting to see what happens. Also during the times of pregnancy when we don't need to release any more eggs, um, inhibin is going to be used there as well. Now, the penile gland is going to be talked about in the nervous system as well. It is attached to the roof of the third ventricle of the brain. A ventricle in the brain is an opening. Um, this is actually part of the diencephalon in the brain. Um, it's connected to the hypothalamus. This gland is sec going to secrete, secrete what we call melatonin. Melatonin regulates your diurnal rhythm, so it makes you sleepy. This is why when it starts to get dark outside, it makes you tired um, and that sort of thing. That's why people, a lot of times, if they're having trouble sleeping or going to sleep, they might take melatonin. Um, this is a more natural way to help with them as a sleep aid instead of taking something like Ambien or something like that. Uh, melatonin also regulates seasonal breeding patterns in some animals, um, not in humans because it doesn't really matter when we breed, but in some animals it does because the day length is really important. Melatonin is regulated by visual detection of light, so light actually inhibits melatonin from being secreted, um, so light helps keep you awake, or at least normally it does. Okay, This is why sometimes if you're trying to do your homework or you're reading and it's darker, you may fall asleep. This is because melatonin is being produced, or if you're in a lecture and the teacher turns down the lights, this this can also happen. Um, seasonal affective disorder, or what we call SAD, this is winter depression. This happens whenever um, 
we don't get enough sunlight. Um, you see this a lot of times in Seattle where they um, don't get a lot of sunny days. It rains most of the time. You also can see this in Alaska where they have their 30 days of night where the sun never comes up for 30 days. Um, so it can cause some major issues. Um, the way we treat this is you put them under bright lights. The whole idea of bright lights is gonna help decrease the amount of melatonin and it will help with their mood, keep them awake, that sort of thing. Okay, so this is a penile gland. Now, other endocrine tissues, we are going to talk about each of these in a lot more detail when we get to the chapters that they are located in, but the thymus gland is located in the mediastinum, which is in the middle of the chest. Um, it secretes several hormones that help the immune system. The GI tract is going to release several hormones that help with digestion. The placenta, which is only present during pregnancy, so it's a temporary organ that only females will have. It secretes what we call HCG, which is human... Um, cryonic gonadotropin. This helps maintain the pregnancy whenever implantation takes place. This is also though going to be the hormone that's detected by a pregnancy test. Okay, um, When you get those pregnancy tests that you urinate on and it detects and tells you if you're pregnant or not, this is the hormone that it's actually detecting. Um, the placenta will also secrete estrogens and progesterone again to maintain the pregnancy and to prepare the mammary glands for milk production. The kidneys are going to release several hormones, which again we'll talk about. Um, they'll secrete what we call um, EPO or EPO, which is uh, erythropoietin. This will actually tell your bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Um, it also secretes the calcicitrol, which we already talked about, which helps activate vitamin D. Your skin produces inactive forms of vitamin D in the presence of sunlight, and so again, this is going to be used in conjunction with calcicitrol to absorb calcium, so it acts kind of like a hormone. And then the atria of your heart, your heart itself, the two top chambers of the atria, they actually secrete a hormone called ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide. This actually helps lower your blood pressure. So when your blood pressure gets too high, your heart will detect that, obviously, because it's beating and it's pushing this blood um, and it's coming back with a lot higher pressure. And so it releases a hormone to even lower your blood pressure. It's kind of your natural way to lower it when it gets too high. So these are just some more examples. Now, you'll recall from lecture one, we talked about another group of hormones that hasn't even been hit on, um, the um, ikenosinoids. These are going to deal with immunity. So when we talk about uh, the immune system, we'll get to them more. They're produced by most of your body tissues, and this they're going to be released a lot of times when they're damaged, when your body tissues are damaged. Um, so they are either paracrine or hormones or autocrine hormones. They're going to they're gonna act in a local area, either on the cell that released them or on cells that are nearby. A lot of times they're used as a second messenger system. An example of this are prostaglandins. They're involved in the inflammatory response. So like when you get a cut and it gets inflamed, or it gets red and it feels warm, um, it, there's swelling that's present, there's pain, that's the inflammatory response, okay? That fever and pain in that area. Leukotrienes are involved in chemotaxis of white blood, uh, white blood cells. What they do is they are trying to draw white blood cells in to help during the inflammatory response to make sure that they help fight any infection that could take place because you now have an opening or a cut or damage to the tissue. Um, things like aspirin, acetaminophen, or NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. Um, these are going to inhibit certain enzymes which are necessary for the prostaglandins to be produced, and this is why they're, they're called anti-inflammatory drugs.